You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the latest episode of Star Trek Picard called Disengage. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hey, Father Corey. How's it going? And Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, be sure to follow The Secrets of Star Trek in Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, you know, the places, your favorite podcast app, or at the StarQuest YouTube channel where you can see our beautiful faces and hit the bell to get notifications whenever we're ha- we have a new episode there. I want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Technology. You can find that wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash technology. So we're talking about the second episode of season three of Picard called Disengage. Jimmy, can you give us a recap of what happens? This week on Raffi Musiker season three, Raffi's mysterious handler tells her not to investigate the terrorist attack any further because it's being blamed on a Romulan terrorist. But she investigates anyway. She goes to a Ferengi criminal who fingered the Romulan terrorist and says she knows he's lying because she works for the terrorist and she wants to know who he's really covering for. But the Ferengi knows she's lying because he has the head of the Romulan terrorist and he's about to have his goons kill Rafi. But Worf busts in and kills the Ferengi and his goons. And it turns out that he's Rafi's secret handler. Meanwhile, on the Captain Picard show, Captain Picard, Riker and Jack Crusher are having a confrontation with the heavily armed mystery ship. The mystery ship tries to beam Jack Crusher out, and when that doesn't work, they try boarding the Elios, and when that doesn't work, they start tractoring it aboard. At this point, the Titan shows up, because Seven of Nine managed to convince Captain Shaw to intervene. The Titan beams everyone off the Elios, after which Captain Vadic of the mystery ship, the Shrike, uh, makes contact. She says Jack Crusher is a criminal with a bounty on his head, and she wants to take him into custody. Captain Shaw finds records indicating that Jack is a criminal, and since they're outside Federation space and outmatched by the Shrike, he's inclined to turn him over. But Picard says no and acknowledges that Jack Crusher, big surprise, is his son. Unable to compete with the Shrike in battle, the Titan then plunges deep into the nebula in a desperate attempt to evade it. The End so, um, this episode starts with the usual two weeks ago, uh, which is one of those uh, TV tropes that we do. We go, we jump back um, <clears throat> to see the Elios approaching a planet that has apparently got a plague going on, uh, not Earth. And it's uh, they're bringing medical supplies. We, we don't see Beverly. We only see Jack here, uh, which is interesting in itself. And they're they're intercepted by the Fenris Rangers. I'm still kind of unclear. What is the, what is the role of the Fenris Rangers? Are they like a private security firm or they're, freelancers? They're they're more like the old um, old west style posse's and things like that, where they were kind of law where it was lawless. You know, they right. weren't like an official um, government organization or anything like that. They were just people who, in a way, took law into their own hands self-appointed quasi uh sanctioned law folk Mm -hmm. um yeah because they're inside federation space i'm pretty sure i think it it is some some of it was um i think when we when we saw seven if i remember right when we saw seven with the rangers they were outside of federation space okay okay so uh so jack is bringing his ship to the Ilios, which looks like a Starfleet vessel, frankly. It's got the configuration, the the the, the main mm-hmm. primary hull and the nacelles. Um, it's, it calls it a Mariposa medical vessel, which is kind of interesting. Um, well, the Mariposa medical movement was founded by Rios and Teresa. <gasps> That's why it's familiar. In the 21st century. Okay. Okay. So, so the medical organization that Rios helped to found when he stayed back behind. Kind of like Doctors Without Borders. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. I get that. So, um, so they're part of that. And he says they're bringing medical supplies to get bored. They get, they look around. He ends up bribing one of the Rangers because he's also bringing weapons in. And, uh, it turns out 
the uh, one of the Rangers is now going to betray Crusher to the marked woman, which we have to assume is Captain Vedic because she's got these interesting scars on her face, which was is probably the markings that we're talking mm-hmm. about. OK, um, so then we jump forward after the opening sequence to present day. Um, Reich and Picard think the Titan has gone, but we know it hasn't. Um, and the Titan detects photonic energy coming from w- what's going on, which is usually like from the right. Shrine. Yeah. Although when they in Star Trek, when they refer to photonic energy, they're usually referring to holograms. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wonder again if this is um, something that involving, you know, in the in the credits we have the, something referring to something going on in a holodeck, and we talked about how uh, Moriarty shows up at some point in this season in a large or small role of some sort. So that's small. kind of interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so um, the so they're being faced down by this bigger ship, Picard you know uses his brain and puts up transport inhibitors because uh to, which just is, in time which is a clever thing to do yeah. and they they play they play it off nicely they jack is like jibing him for what are you doing you know and i forget how he puts it but like uh and and he says i'm 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 not ignoring our situation i'm planning right and mm-hmm. it's like for what and then they try to beam him out for that <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. um and and they deduce that that means that whoever's on the mystery ship wants crusher and wants him alive right and they want him above it you know beverly or anyone else it's he he's the target here um which gets confirmed when captain vedic comes up on the screen um she uh shaw refuses to go to the rescue i'm not going to risk all the people on my ship for these rogue starfleet officers who were off on another adventure which again He's quite right. I mean, it's justified mm-hmm. yeah. um, because he's, he's outgunned. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a he's a jerk in this, but he is one hundred percent right, and he's actually somewhat sympathetic of a character because he's being put in this situation where he's coming across as the bad guy when actually he's the one who's doing things properly, and Riker and Picard are the ones who are breaking all the rules and doing right. their own thing. Right. It's interesting that that the Titan is so outgunned because my understanding is it used to be that it was a sort of battleship version of a starship, you know, that it was a, but the, the strike is kind of typically of a lot of these bad guys way overpowered. (laughs) Yeah. They established that it has basically every weapon the Federation knows about and some that it doesn't. Right. So Shaw refuses to go to the rescue and the bad guy doesn't attack. She, She doesn't attack. She blows the shuttle off the back of the uh, of the of the Ilios to prevent them from escaping. So she's toying with them and she kind of does this throughout the episode. You know, once they're on the Titan, she gives them an hour to hand over Jack. Why? Like, it doesn't seem well, like I she would should have I, I, I would. No, I think that's reasonable. Um, if you're trying to negotiate a, a handover of someone and you can assume this person you're handing over is it's not going to go well for them. And if you're all Federation, ideally, nobly, you know, it can make sense to give you time to think about it mm. because it is she and, she, you know, she's not inside Shaw's head. She doesn't know what he knows. And right. it may take time for the reality of the situation to sink in. For him. Well, and, right. And, and as Shaw says, is, you know, we're trapped in a corner in space that has no corners. You know, in theory, <laughs> right. they shouldn't be trapped, but they are. Right. And she knows that she knows or at least she thinks that. She's got them outgunned, out-engined, out, you know, everything that, again, as he points out, the second they crank up the nacelles, she fires, they're done. She seems to know a lot about all of them, too. She, like, she references Shaw's psychological profile with Starfleet. Yeah, how about that? So somebody's she, got inside track on things? Yeah. It would seem. Well, that would go back to Beverly Crusher's don't trust Starfleet. So mm-hmm. right, there's yeah. a leak somewhere. Uh, which and we it's, saw before, right? And it's clear she's not the big bad of the big bads. She's just the she, the one that's hired to get a hold of him. Right. Hold she's him. getting him for somebody else. Is an, she's an interim uh, level boss, <laughs> not the big yeah. boss at the end. <laughs> one, one part of the, of the trap situation, though, that I couldn't help wondering about was 
Um, Shaw says that help is days away. And I'm going, really? Because last episode, y'all got here way fast. Overnight. <laughs> yeah. And how is help days away if you came all the way from Earth to the edge of Federation space in less than 24 hours? This is the J.J. Abrams space compression problem, mm-hmm. which they keep I, on, doing. <laughs> on top of the... There's only one ship with anywhere near the Earth system, and you're the only one that can stop this problem. <laughs> right, right. It's yeah. I wish the the writers would. I mean, I I know I I'm, I could be classified as one of those picky fans who's always nitpicking at the details, but this is a this is a storytelling problem where mm-hmm. if you're telling us that you traveled overnight to get to this place, and now you're days away, you know, from Earth, and now you're days away from help, it's it's a story problem. And yeah. And, and in general, they really need to get a hold of this. And you don't have to, you don't, it doesn't have to be days away. It's sufficient. They're not there. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, right. she gave you an hour. As long as helps more than an hour away, you're okay from a writing perspective. You don't have to <laughs> ramp this up in the dialogue. You can just let mm-hmm. it be what it is. Or tell us it took days to get there or whatever, you yeah. know, but yeah, just, yeah. it doesn't have, it's, it just feels sloppy as opposed to a, a writing thing you couldn't get around. Um, so in any case, um, we shift the story at this point shifts to Rafi's, uh, the Rafi series, as you put it, Jimmy, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and the terror attack. And, you know, she's watching, um, the Federation news network or whatever. Um, Romulan dissident is blamed for the attack, um, who watched too many, who played the uh, video game portal, <laughs> which is anyone who's played portal, <laughs> it, uh, got you know, got the reference there oh, yeah. from that the way the weapon works um and she doesn't believe the story of course and she wants to find the ferengi named sneed who sold the weapon um but her handler says starfleet has ended the investigation now was it one of you who said that they believe the handler is wharf or was that somewhere else no it must have been somewhere else i okay. thought the handler because there's apparently someone that hasn't been advertised that's major um, that's going to be coming back in the series. And I thought that that person might be the handler, but it wasn't. The handler was Worf. <laughs> yeah. I think it was somebody on our Discord might have right. mentioned him. Okay. Okay. So kudos for, for, mm-hmm. for calling out Worf on that one because that, that was a good one. Uh, I have to say, you know, jumping ahead a bit, just seeing Worf show up, hearing the Klingon theme music, mm-hmm. Worf going to town with the Batleth in, you know, on uh, streaming where he can do more damage than on yeah. TV. <laughs> this, I, I, I have in my notes, it's nice to see an unrestrained Worf in a bloody fight, which right. is something they couldn't do as really in yeah. back in the day, but they can now. And, and okay, this is very effective. This is what it would be like if a Klingon like Worf were, were attacking you. It would be very bloody. Right, yep. right. And yeah, seeing the, uh, the, the white-haired uh, mm-hmm. older Worf. Um, yeah. It was, Although was good. Ba- Batless are still ridiculous weapons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they this are. This more of the sword style, too, though. It wasn't the, the full Batless. Uh, yeah, I didn't get a close look at it. So, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, they have, they have, the Klingons have crazy weapons. <laughs> the, the, the edged weapons. Um, so uh, she, Rafi, ends up going to her ex-husband, Jay, uh, mm-hmm. to to get that intro to Sneed because somehow it was, he's an artist, but he also owns a club, I think. A he's, bar, yeah. A bar, okay. And he has connections to the underworld somehow. And this all must have been in season one, This all this stuff about Jay. Actually, I don't know that it was. I mean, I, I, I think he, they may have actually picked up his name from the, um, from, from the spinoff material because there's more about him in the Una McCormick novel. Oh, uh, right. Picard season one that goes into her, more into her relationship with her husband and how it fell apart. Um, so I think he's, that's actually where he's named. I don't know that he's named in Picard season one. <laughs> okay. Now, we meet, now, we meet her son. Yes. There, but we don't meet him. Right. Uh, uh, that's what he's talking about for that. She ambushed him in the doctor's office. Oh, that scene. In, yeah. Cause he's got a Romulan wife or something. Right, right, right. So I knew I'd heard his, him from somewhere, but yeah, I guess it was the book. So, um, she, he, he kind of gives her this jerk choice. I <laughs> to say, yeah, you know, I will either introduce you to, uh, Sneed or I will help you reconcile with our son, but I'm not going to do both. Like, 
why would you like she just told you that there's the, some, there's something bigger going on the well the i guess in his mind the reason is she's on this dangerous path mm -hmm. and he doesn't want her dragging the danger into the life of their son so he doesn't want his son mixed up with her if she's going to be in this danger zone oh. and and that's why he'll only do one well and he also says that she turns conspiratorial before she gets into the drugs mm -hmm. and so right. this sounds to him like oh this is a conspiracy theory when actually no she's being an intel officer following her leads even though her handler told her not to right and and uh but he's going oh no you're just you're just following conspiracy theories next thing you know you're gonna be on the drugs and your life is gonna be ruined again and i don't want that to happen to our family right right that's true so she does make the choice, the, the difficult choice to, to get the information about Sneed, we find out. Um, and she goes and confronts him. Like you said, Jimmy, she pretends to have been part of the Romulans organization uh, confronting Sneed to find it because she's convinced that the Romulan is just a patsy. There's someone else. It's a false flag. Someone else is really behind it. And, this, and the Ferengi would know. She goes in and he... He immediately drops like you're. You, for all I know, you could be Section Thirty One, and I'm like, from an organization that supposedly doesn't exist and no one knows about it. Everyone seems to be oh, know well, about it. Well, the Dominion War was central to the resolution. I mean, the Section Thirty One was central to the resolution of the Dominion War, and the Dominion War was some time ago now. So I guess yeah, maybe could have got out. better now. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And merely, I was kind of half hoping with that that name drop of Section Thirty One is that we would see Bashir as the head of it. <laughs> Oh, that would be fun. Or but, Michelle Yeoh coming back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was still great to see Worf, but I, that, that yeah. would be cool if, if it would be Bashir showing up, blasting everyone or something, you know? Yes. As like the spy master. That would, that yeah. would be the ultimate. I mean, maybe we still will. Maybe Bashir, maybe he's the one where the, the rumored big return of somebody that we're going to get. That would be good. Um, so, uh, and then we get Worf coming to the rescue there, as you mentioned. Um, so the, back to the other story with <laughs> the Picard story um, seven on board the Titan has to go in. She's been dismissed by uh, Shaw and sent to her quarters, but she comes back and confronts him and says, yeah, actually on, on, I, I was a little confused with what is seven of nine's work status because he keeps like dismissing her from, from duty. And then she's back doing her duties and then she gets dismissed again. And, it I is a little confusing. Yeah, I think she's he's sort of telling her you're off the you know you're suspended basically whatever the, the, yeah. the case, and she's kind of refusing to to obey right. it. I mean, she's already broken orders already. So what? So but that's he why seemed, he threatens. To, he he seems to be letting her function. Like she starts giving yeah. orders on the bridge, and he lets her do it. And so it, I I thought yeah. I was confused about exactly what is her work status right now. I think he is too. I think that's what, what they're showing is that Shaw's a little, on the one hand, he wants to confine seven to quarters. On the other hand, he's in this situation that he's doesn't can't find, he's in the corner, can't find his way out. And she seems to be capable. She's dealt with a lot more, a lot more of these violent, you know, battle situations than he has apparently. And so he kind of leans on her, even though he doesn't want to, that's my sense of, yeah. of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, but she does Go ahead. Just, you know, despite the fact he's coming on uh, this confident, you know, I'm in charge. You will do what I say in the back of his mind. He's like, I have no idea how to handle this. I have <laughs> right. no idea. And, you know, they, they did kind of hint to that with, with Vatic talking about his psychological profile, that right. there's some, there are probably some insecurities and things like that in the background. That's keeping him from just either outright, you know, you're locked in quarters until, you know, hell freezes over the ship blows up, whichever <laughs> comes first. or Right. You know, trusting her and letting her kind of take some of the lead here with her experience. You know, someone on our Discord server said, you know, this the Titan should have been a Cali class uh, ship because he really feels like a Cali class captain. Yeah, he does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would have been that would have been great to get a uh, lower decks reference there. Uh, so she but seven comes and confronts Shaw and, rem and reminds him, look, you could either be the, a hero here in this situation, saving. Picard and Riker or be known as the guy who stood by while two legends were killed. 
And apparently that's enough to get him to act uh, in this in here. And it was kind of cool just as, uh, you know, the, the Ilios is in his tractor beam that's about to rip it to pieces. And just as that's it's about to be destroyed, the Titan warps in, just like jumps in in between and beams them out and and then jumps away uh, or not doesn't actually get too far away. Uh, they're chased down and um, <laughs> the Shrike uses the Ilios as a battering ram it like kind of throws it at the uh yeah. at the ship this was a really nice use of a tractor beam because yeah. we haven't seen that before on star trek but using it to throw big heavy objects at people is a good battlefield use of the tractor <laughs> beam yeah <laughs> well and it's, it's it's something that goes all the way back to first season of tng the naked now where wesley figures out how to use the tractor beam as a repulsor beam get the enterprise out of the way of some debris from the star Right, 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 right. That's and right. It, and I wrote down, why don't they use this more often? This is, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, if you know, this, we can't, our weapons can't get through their shields. Weapons might not be able to, but just raw chunks of, say, rock and other starships absolutely could. But that would be an interesting battle tactic to use in, I mean, use it against the Borg as a thing, you know, I mean. That, Blunt force. It would be interesting <laughs> to see them use that in a show. Um, So we've got, uh, Crusher and Picard and the both Crushers and Picard and Riker on board the Titan now and Shaw reveals the truth of that or a truth about Crusher which is that he's a con man with a lot of aliases mm -hmm. which raises the question is he really Jack Crusher or is that an alias too uh, although later on when Beverly shows up I, okay let's deal with this here she doesn't actually say the mm -hmm. Jack is Picard's son. She kind no. of nods meaningfully and he mm -hmm. jumps the rest of the way. Yeah, there it, it it's not as explicit as it could be. And, you know, as I'm watching it, I'm thinking, OK, could this be a fake out? And is he actually Picard's son? Is he even actually Beverly's son? You know, you've got to think about these possibilities. And um and I, I I think he is the way they've structured the story yeah. to have him turn out to be some random nobody who's neither Beverly nor Picard's son would be viewed by the the viewer as a cheat. Yeah. Right. And so I think, yeah, now, given what they've established so far, he is Beverly and Picard's son. Mm -hmm. OK. If not, there's a serious writing flaw. Right. Or they have to come up with some really good <laughs> baffle gap to get us yeah. get him out of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so because Riker confronts Picard at one point and says, mm -hmm. look, are we going to talk about this or not? And they go back and forth without actually saying it. But Picard, but Riker's trying to get Picard to say that he is Jack's father. And Picard will not talk about whether it's mm -hmm. even possible, you know, being the gentleman that he is, I guess. Yeah, and Riker, as early as last episode, said, "Does he remind you of someone?" To Picard, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and then in this episode, he's like, "Are you not seeing what I'm seeing?" <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, and it was, I mean, because the audience is doing the same thing, right? We're we're sitting there going, "Well, duh," you know, Jack Crusher, mm -hmm. Beverly's son, tw about twenty something years old. Well, um, he has the, has the accent because, of course, you know, accents are apparently genetic. genetic. The Star Trek it, universe. Epigenetic, and, yeah. And speaks, <laughs> speaks French at one point. So, I mean, yes, there yes. you go. <laughs> <laughs> but it, Shaw doesn't believe that that he's Crusher's son, you know, um, mm -hmm. it, which at this point I'm thinking, and maybe we're all thinking this, it's the 25th century. You could scan him and find out. <laughs> Yeah, they do tricorder. They established as long ago as the chase in TNG that a tricorder can read your DNA <laughs> at a distance right. without a sample. You don't need anything, you know, nothing to, uh, fancy to just find out that he is Picard and Beverly's yeah, son. Just like, just look at his Y chromosome. <laughs> right. It, it 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 that that to me is a bit of a flaw. I, I just have to say. I mean, just just you know, take a moment and scan him. Um, but, uh, so they put him in the brig and mm -hmm. Starfleet security up to its usual 
good job. <laughs> Don't yeah. frisk the prisoner. So to find out that he's got a device on him that can take down a force shield. Speaking of tricorders, tricorders can find things like <laughs> devices that take down a force shield. Right, right. Yeah. He he did need to know the frequency or strength of the force field. And I like that they, I, it was a nice touch that the guard is required to tell him yeah. what the frequency or strength of the force field is, lest he injure himself in trying to escape. So it's like, this is sort of the a 24th century equivalent of you, you get one phone call, yeah. you right. know, it's like a procedural thing that's there for the benefit of the prisoner. I have a right to know how this force field operates. And so the guy tells him it's a level 10 force field and, and, and says, why don't you just stick out your tongue and find out, which was nice. That was yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah. And he provokes the guard to coming right up to him so that he can drop the, 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 the shield and headbutt him out, out cold, which I'm not sure why uh, Jack isn't out cold, but okay. Um, but yeah, that was nice. I did. I did like that. That was if for as far as jailbreaks go. That was because Star Trek has a lot of jailbreaks. Uh, mm -hmm. That one that one worked out pretty well. Um, so. Before that, Picard has come to confront Jack and. Without saying without addressing the elephant in the room, he's trying to get him to admit who he is and why he's why they're after him, why Vadik wants him so bad. And Jack at this point says, hand me over to protect my mother. That's, that's really, you know, mm -hmm. his thing. And in fact, when he escapes, the first thing he does is he's going to a transporter room to beam himself over, to take the, the question out of the hands of Shaw or Picard or anybody. Um, and that's, I feel like that's what convinces Shaw that maybe there's something about Crusher mm -hmm. that's on the up and up that, yeah, that, because that's, and that's why, when Picard says he's my son, Shaw surprisingly goes with it and says, okay. And, you know, fights back against Vatic and then goes to hide in the nebula. Um, I thought that was an interesting sequence there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was, and, it was, it was kind of weird at first because Picard immediately, you know, Shaw's like, okay, we're going to beam him over you know, get ready to beam him over. And then, when Picard realizes that this, yes, this is my son, then he immediately admirals overrule and starts, you know, changing orders. And it's like, you're not an admiral anymore. You're a retired admiral. <laughs> but yet, like you said, Shaw allows him to do it. And, you know, yeah. I think Shaw was kind of stunned to go, so why? And that's right. when he says, it's my son. It's like, okay. Yep. <laughs> and Shaw gets on. Now. Yeah, yeah. And Shaw gets on board at that point. Yep. Yeah, it's Picard's. I think it, Picard is it's like a big bluff. He's like, you know, Admiral orders belay that order, and you know, I think he knows he doesn't really have any authority here, but he's trying to kind of bluff his way through with his force of his personality and his reputation and all that sort of stuff. Um, I mean, it would we be enough to, to get the, the crew to kind of pause anyway. Yeah. yeah, and we do see kind of more the classic confident <clears throat> take charge Picard. Yeah. So that that's been one he's nice thing about this season. We do see a lot more of that. Than we have previous seasons. Yeah, less of the questioning, um, psychologically unsteady Picard. Yep. Um, so, and then they run from the Shrike, which is what they should have done in the first place, into the nebula, just like in Wrath of Khan, actually. Mm -hmm. This is kind of interesting, given uh, we're going to have some feedback, which raises other interesting parallels with Wrath of Khan. But um, so we're going to get a Wrath of Khan like nebula pursuit perhaps um which should be interesting um although presumably let's Vatic just does... hope they don't use the genesis device <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah. <laughs> yeah well and presumably Vatic doesn't have the same uh two-dimensional thinking flaw that uh, khan had uh yeah. which is what kirk yeah, used exactly. should have gone to battle school <laughs> <laughs> and e even ender and bean would have done better uh so um so and that's where the episode ends i want to talk a bit about a youtube video that you you sent along jimmy in a bit mm -hmm. but do any other notes on this episode before we wrap things up father Corey? one thing i noticed about the the shrike the the ship that vatic has <laughs> the, the the deflector dish at the bottom it looks kind of like an eye but it also looks very similar to the enterprise d's deflector dish just <sighs> orange instead of blue Ooh, interesting just, and I, I mean i don't know if that was just a design decision because again it looks kind of like an eye at the bottom of it yeah, but it's the same exact shape as the D's deflector dish. Wonder if someone has re recovered parts of the Enterprise D, that fat little ship, <laughs> off yeah. of the Generation Planet. 
curious. It would be curious. Probably I mean, maybe not. I, I don't, I don't but, know. If it, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's obviously it's the the Galaxy class deflector dish. It doesn't have to necessarily be the D, but still, it was just yeah. an interesting design de- design de- decision to use the same shape for that. That's interesting. Okay. Anything else? That's it, Jimmy. So one thing we didn't talk about is uh, in the Rafi Musiker show, she is forced by Sneed to prove that because he thinks she's Section 31 or something. Right. right. And so he gives her a test. And the test is she has to take this drug. And, of course, this is a big deal for Rafi because she's a former drug addict. And um, the drug in question is an interesting one. It's called Splinter. It's apparently a creation of Sneed's. Uh, we see other people using it earlier in the episode. And instead of swallowing it or injecting it, you open your eye and shine this, put the drug in your eye or shine this thing in your eye. And I like that. That's nice and creative as a drug delivery mechanism. Um, Actually, it is possible to uh to to take medication through your eyes um and that's that's why there are medicated eye drops to that you know you'll take before i uh, before and after eye surgery for example and it also is a bit of a i get the sense there's something electronic about this drug and that ties in with the episode of tng the game where they where they have this video game that it 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 puts it's played through a headset that that puts things in front of your eyes and when you score it activates the pleasure center in your brain so this may be doing something similar and mm-hmm. so he he forced sneed forces rafi to take a dose of splinter <clears throat> and and then she tells him the same story even when she's under the effect of the drug and he marvels at that because he knows she's lying. Um, and he is like, wow, you must be a real addict if you can <laughs> resist the effects that well. Um, which is actually kind of like um, the end of the novel Ringworld Engineers, where mm-hmm. the hero, uh, Louis, Louis Wu, is an ex-wirehead, meaning he has a... He has a wire connected to the pleasure center of his brain, and he beat wire. So that's like the most pure form of pleasure imaginable for a human. And he beat wirehead addiction. And then at the end of the novel, he's exposed to a substance called Tree of Life, which is if you're over the age of 45, which he's 200, if you're over the age of 45, tree of life will cause you to become irrational and want to do nothing more than eat tree of life. And in order to win at the end of the novel, he has to resist the effect of tree of life. And because he's an X wire addict, he actually has the strength of will to ignore the impulses. The tree of life is causing in him and win. Hmm. And so it having beat an addiction, a powerful addiction before he's able to, stave off this one and we see something similar happening with Rafi here where she's able to resist the effects of the drug she's still high but she's got enough control that she can maintain her story under the effects of the drug and so I thought that was all very interesting and then we have a nice reveal with um uh with Sneed saying, well, here's how I know you don't work for him. And he will pulls out his head. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know why severed heads on TV never look real. Now, I'm not saying I've ever seen a severed human head. I'm not <laughs> yeah. saying that, but they don't look real. Maybe they're not, they, they're not allowed to. I mean, they, they, <laughs> they do all kinds of other things. I mean. I wonder if it's still the weakness of even, you know, being able to do the, the doing the, uh, the cast and all that. I wonder if that's still just kind of a weakness of artificial I don't know. heads I've, like that. I've seen some dead bodies that look really like the person. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's just, we don't want to, I don't know. I, I think it's a limitation on makeup technology I, okay. I think, and prop technology. I think we could make a more realistic severed head than what we typically see. I'm not sad about it. <laughs> uh-huh. I just but, find it a distraction. It's like, here's this severed head, and I'm going, oh, this fake. <laughs> did did yeah. you get that at uh, the, the Halloween store? <laughs> yeah. 
I, I, um, I did forget one one thing that I did want oh, to yeah. mention. Uh, the the shuttle that Riker and Picard took over was the shuttle Savick. Oh, was it? Oh, you of see, course, just as as the as the uh, remnants of it are floating into space, they show very briefly mm-hmm. the nameplate as it floats past the camera. That's interesting. Given, well, no, no, it's not Savick who. No, 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 no. Um, she wasn't. She wasn't the the, the traitor Vulcan. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. That was Savick, Valeris. Valeris. It was. It was going to be Savick, but that's what my became Valeris. Valeris. Uh, my, according to the wiki, Savick eventually became the captain of the first Titan. Oh, that would make sense. Oh, cool. Um, all right. So I wanted to met, talk about this video that you found, Jimmy, the, mm-hmm. that it doesn't come out and say it, but it sort of puts together elements from the TNG two-parter conspiracy where the mm-hmm. bug parasites that never got followed up in TNG um, and things that may be similar in Picard season three. And the implication is that maybe the bugs are back. The parasitic mm-hmm. bugs that were trying to take over that had, you know, taken over certain admirals and other high ranking people in Starfleet. Um, and that would make sense of the don't trust, trust no one, don't trust Starfleet mm-hmm. right. element of this. Yeah. Right. So what do you think? I mean, I, I kind of feel like it's a bit of a stretch because it doesn't really explain well, what would Crusher's. She's a medical doctor. I mean, Jack. She, she, uh, Sorry, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, what would his role be? Why well, is he important? He, he's also a medical doctor. Um, and they, the two of them could have uncovered this. He might have even been the first. Um, now, I'm not saying that that's what I think is happening this season, but mm-hmm. I think it would be, I think it's an interesting idea, and I'd love mm-hmm. to see it explored because they, they introduced those, they implied they'd be back, and then they dropped the ball. Yeah. And, and having a, having a who can you trust conspiracy thriller would be fun i think so i think um i think it would be it would be fun for them to go back to that and finally and say what are the things of tng that we never we never mm-hmm. closed the loop on and finding this and saying this this needs to have the loop closed i i would i would agree that would be fun if they if they could pull it off i i do think the the idea with the hologram the holodeck m- might have some merit that there's something about this that's not as it appears Mm. You know, and because again, there was that line about well, there's photonic energy, which again means a hologram or a holodeck. But right. what that means, how it plays out, you know, all this yeah. is actually Riker and Riker and Troy doing a, a story where they're, they're we, we don't, no, I'm kidding. We don't talk about Fight Club. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, maybe Vadik herself is not real. Maybe that's just something oh. else behind her. Yeah. By the way, speaking of Vadik, another thing we should mention. She's played by Amanda Plummer, who is the daughter of Christopher Plummer. Right. We should. Yeah, that's right. She's the daughter of the Christopher Plummer, who was the Klingon in Star Trek six. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. You know, let's let the dogs the great, of great war. actor, Christopher Plummer. You know, oh, yeah. The great actors. By the way, since we mentioned the conspiracy bugs video, we should probably put a link to that in the show notes. so I will, people can see it. Yes, I will put a link in the in the show notes for that. that definitely. All right. So I think that does it for our discussion of disengage this time. Uh, Let's go to our feedback and our first feedback. uh, This first bit of feedback is coming from our last discussion on the first episode of season three, next generation. And the first one comes from Dennis Tremethic on YouTube who writes, I like this episode and look forward to the rest of the season. As a person who's getting older, I appreciated the little quips from Riker, such as, I don't remember having to get up as often to pee as a cadet and your hands are stiff and my knees are killing me. As long as we don't have to run and shoot, we'll be fine. <laughs> those, those were some good those lines. Were fun. They were yeah. fun. Yeah. And I also sympathize. Uh, then Keith Wood writes on YouTube. I don't know if I were in my eighties and being filmed in high def, I think I would want them to dim the lights as well. Uh, that was my reference to how dark everything is all the time. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Les on our Discord writes, there's a good reason for Seven to mutiny. There are three scenarios. One, she sides with Captain Boring, dead end career, because in insulting Picard for being an ex-Borg, he's also telling Seven, your performance reviews for me will be zero because you are ex-Borg. Or two, Go to the destination Picard wanted. If it was just a whim of Picard, she's lost nothing because her career was dead with Captain Boring anyway, and Picard may have a plan for her. It may be a win. Or three, go to the destination Picard wanted. If it is important, she wins big time. Siding with Picard is the only winnable scenario. So I, I 
they hint that something like that may have played a role in Seven's thinking, uh, because in episode one, they they talk about how she feels like she's kind of in a dead end in her career and that she lo- enjoyed things more as a Fenris Ranger. And mm. so they kind of, if she's concluded, I don't want to be in Starfleet, then, you know, this line of reasoning could make sense. Um, I'm, I question whether and I recognize they're kind of it appears they're going that way, but I question that as a writing decision because you spent last season getting her into Starfleet mm. and you don't want to immediately undo yeah. something you just achieved that was like a proud triumph. And um and so I mean the we had this subplot last season of she's Borg and so Starfleet didn't want her and then she finally gets in and okay that's a victory for the character and to have the character immediately say eh I don't like this victory I want to go back the other way okay it's it's like when people point out how Star Trek 3 consistently undoes the achievements of Star Trek 2 you know Mm. we get Carol Marcus we get David Marcus, we get the Genesis device, and oh, the Genesis device doesn't work. <laughs> right. Oh, and David Marcus is dead now, and right. you know it, it. It 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 feels wrong when, from a viewer perspective, when something that the characters have been striving for is immediately dumped, and they don't have a chance to enjoy it. And this would be us immediately having seven sour on being in Starfleet instead of having the chance to enjoy being in Starfleet. And if mm. so I'm I would question it as a writing decision. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I, I agree. I hope that's not that that by the end of the season there's some reconciliation between Shaw and Seven. She's won back his trust and he's you know, I think it's possible and probable he he's going to end up like changing his mind about Picard and Riker and all that other stuff. And then dying. <laughs> and then dying. Right. Like the other way that they could solve the problem is they could have kill him off. Um, so, and then our next uh, feedback comes from Chris Shortell via e- email who writes, I've read some online criticism that Picard finding a son he never knew about is a ripoff of Star Trek two. However, sometimes I think we're blind to wrath of Khan's flaws because of how good it is compared to all the other Star Trek movies. It's easy to forget that Carol and David Marcus were invented by Nicholas Meyer and had never be- before been mentioned in Star Trek and Carol Marcus never shows up again, although she was referenced in the beginning of the novelization of Star Trek VI. Significantly, she isn't even the person Kirk ends up with in the Nexus in Generations either. That's another invented one-off character in Tonia. Conversely, Crusher and Picard have a long history on screen together, including romantic tension and a will-they-or-won't-they dynamic throughout TNG's run. So Picard having a son he didn't know about with her is actually far more realistic and earned than Kirk finding out about David and Ratha Khan and I'm fine with it in this show. So what do you think? Is this a ripoff I'm, of... I, I'm fine with it, too. I agree. Yeah. This is more earned than David Marcus was. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I, I mean, I would have liked to have seen go a different way with it, but if this is the way they are going, I mean, we, we still, it hasn't been set for 100% for sure that this is what's happening, but if they do go with it, that's fine, but it would have been kind of fun to see them go a different way. Right. I mean, it does feel kind of like an echo or copy or whatever of of Rathacon with a couple of these elements. So we'll have to see how, where they're going. I, you know, it, it would make sense to kind of copy the most popular Star Trek movie, <laughs> you know, and, to, if you're going to copy anything. And it is clear they are going with those, ki- that kind of, that era of movie, of Star Trek movie in this series. Yeah. That they, they want the look, the feel, the elements storyline to be very similar to what was done then. Which yeah. is not a bad thing. Those are good movies. Those that was a good movie. Yeah, that was. Um, uh, then our next email is from Eric, who writes, "I'm a longtime listener and big fan of all your podcasts, but I have noticed, especially in the Star Trek series, that Jimmy Aiken has sort of become a Debbie Downer. He's always tearing apart everything. He's becoming, in my opinion, somewhat of an intellectual snob when it comes to discussing fictional television shows. He's always pointing out the flaws." Uh, always pointing out the unrealistic activities, etc. Honestly, it's taken away from the joy of listening to your podcast where he's a participant. I think maybe you should have a talk with him and tell him not to be so much of a podcast troll. But I do love the network and the podcasts. 
Well, thank you, Eric. I'm glad you enjoy the network and the podcasts. Um, you know, not everything is going to be to everyone's taste. I um, see, I, I'm just like Dom and Father Corey, I'm just talking about my experience watching these shows. And these are things I think about um, because I'm a very analytical person and I analyze writing and uh, it doesn't stop me from being able to enjoy the shows. Um, I, I, of the recent, you know, um, Star Trek offerings, I love Lower Decks. Mm -hmm. I very much enjoy Prodigy and Strange New Worlds. Picard is a positive viewing experience for me. It's not my favorite of them, but it's it's on balance positive, especially this season. I like the way it started compared to the previous two seasons. The only one that I'm really negative on is Discovery. And even that, I'm more negative on it as it goes along, which is why I quit watching it. But I wouldn't watch these shows if I didn't enjoy them. And in just talking about them, um, you know, I, I think that it's possible to enjoy a show and recognize its flaws and think about how could they have done this differently in a way that wouldn't have had this flaw and what would be the costs and benefits of going a different way. So that analysis is kind of part of what I have to offer. Um, one thing that might be playing a role is sometimes Father Corey and Dom are a little more enthusiastic up front about mm -hmm. something about in saying, Oh, I love this episode or something. Mm -hmm. And I feel the need to kind of balance that. Yeah. And so I find myself in the role of playing balancer uh, sometimes. And if, if instead of just enthusing, maybe we went around the table and asked, so what did you think of this? You know, it would be, it, it might enable me to lead with the positive a bit more. Um, I don't know if that's something we want to do, but I often find the positive being expressed by others before I can. And then I feel the need to balance the positive to have a balanced view of the show. So that could be part of what's going on, but uh, glad you enjoy the shows overall. I think that's sufficient. Uh, so thank you, Eric, for your email. Um, and then our last bit of feedback comes from uh, our episode 246 on the Enterprise episode Acquisition. And this comes from Truly Awesome New Mexico Catholic on YouTube, who writes, Thanks for another great episode. I really like Enterprise, and this episode's even better than most because it has Neelix in it. I think using the trope of I'm turning the one I'm with against the others added to the good silliness of the episode. Also, the Vatican II Rules of Acquisition connection was gold. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Truly awesome. Never single Catholic. <laughs> Still love that, that handle. That's awesome one, dude. <laughs> or do that. <laughs> do that. Yes. Uh, Another one of my favorite YouTube um, handles is of a user whose uh, name is, or whose handle is 20,000 subscribers without videos challenge. <laughs> and he has no videos on his challenge, but he's working on getting 20,000 subscribers. <laughs> so very contrarian. That's awesome. Uh, and so thank you, everyone, for your feedback. We really do appreciate uh, hearing from you. So let's uh, take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Jeanette F., Joseph S., Benjamin C., Bill and Joanna M., and Andrew H., their generous tax-deductible donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue The Secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. We'd love to hear what you thought of this latest Picard episode, Disengage. You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek, our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Media. Send an email to trek at sqpn.com. Visit our Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. Or watch us on the on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash starquestmedia and leave a comment there. We'll be back next time. We'll be discussing the next new episode of Star Trek Picard called 17 Seconds. Until then, Jimmy Yakin, thank you for join, joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. I really hope 17 Seconds isn't a time loop episode. <laughs> I think we can agree on that. Father Corey Stika, thank you as well. Thank you, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, 
It's been centuries since timepieces last ran on the mechanics of gears, and yet that persistent sound you hear is the gentle tick-tock of passing seconds.